famous L's in fiction? I mean, we've all taken them, especially us here. <laughs> yep, especially yeah. in especially in our recent watch of Power Rangers, where in the team up episode we all took a we all took an L in some form or another. Yeah, how'd you like the Vipari <laughs> coming back, buddy? No, no. How do you like how do you like Joel getting the girl and marrying no! Miss Fairweather? No, he does not deserve that. <laughs> anyway. Uh, <laughs> okay, so in all seriousness, this all idea stemmed from something Tyler put on um, the Discord server. So I can't really find what you actually said, Tyler, but if you want to elaborate, um, go ahead. Oh, wait, what are you referring to? Uh, the thing that you put on um, in the Discord server. We kind of spurred this topic out. Uh... About how uh, people were saying on Reddit about characters taking an L and then all of a sudden they're automatically um um bad characters. Oh oh the fraud talk. Yeah yeah. Uh uh yeah this uh wasn't exactly Reddit I th I th Okay here just uh, yeah I found it. Community, like, calling yeah where like a lot of people in certain communities call certain characters frauds because they don't win every single fight they're in. I feel like that's yeah, like, more prevalent yeah. in mostly the like death battle communities and the Dragon Ball communities, especially. Um, yeah, yeah. And then I said um, as well, it's kind of ironic because those same people would call a character who, di who just dominates every single fight and scene a Mary slash Gary Stew. I mean, you're not wrong, but I feel like those tend to take two very different paths in fiction. Because um, mm -hmm. the Mary Sue tends to be handed everything, like a lot of the characters in manga, especially, like. Unless you're fucking Naruto or Ichigo, you kind of have to take your bombs. Um, yeah, and um, I remember a certain YouTuber back in the day, back in the day who does no longer do it regularly. But the second a character in Bleach lost a the fight, um, they are crusty. They can't fight, even though they've had notable victories before. Like the like Shunsui was the prime example. Like the second Shunsui looks like he was losing the fight against Lilia in the Thousand Year Blood War. Oh, he's crusty. He can't fight when he literally dominated Chad and killed Stark. Yeah, um I primarily see this with like characters like Mihawk and Shanks calling them frauds when like we haven't seen shit from them. Like, we saw a little bit, but that's about it. Yeah, we've got... And, uh, Su and uh, Sukuna's been called a fraud, and Gojo's been called a fraud. Yeah, Gojo, the coward who everyone is like, Gojo's the best, Gojo's amazing, he can't do anything wrong. Loses the fight, he's a fraud! Yeah. I um I've even heard someone call Yamamoto a fraud. Yeah, I was gonna say I saw that and one. <laughs> and it's like Yamamoto, like he he Yamamoto really didn't fight all that much. Yeah, I so, mean he didn't really he, need to fight. His presence was enough to deter most battles, technically. Like like anybody who's like seen or read the manga of Bleach knows like a lieutenant uh, staring guys at Yamamoto absolutely pissed off caused them to vomit. And a uh, lieutenant's meant to be like the second below a captain. So if, um, people calling Yamamoto a four when he can do that, it's like, yeah, you, you don't know what you're talking about. Yeah. And to say that a character is a fraud because they lose a single fight. You have to look at, like, every single character in every single work of fiction and say, like, okay, this character's a fraud, this character... Oh, wait, every, every single character's a fraud? Like, even Luffy, Luffy's had his losses. Mm-hmm. Well, I figure, so, like, oh. now's a perfect time to kind of drag down a couple of these from the archives. Um... Yeah, I put mine in the Discord in the mod stuff chat. If you want to view that, 
so I can give a little bit of context for you guys. It's a very long video. Feel free to skip through it because it's a fucking cutscene. Um, yeah, I cannot find it anywhere. Uh, one second, let me post it again. Uh, that that Google link under the uh, you tagging party champs there. Um, that's that'll take you to the YouTube video. Um, oh, okay. I copied URL there, and it's like, no, we're just going to give you the whole ass fucking Google link again. So I'm like, whatever. So this is from Kingdom Hearts 3, right? And this is about midway through the story. All right. Right before Donald uh, does his famous feat where he is now one of the three characters, I believe, they can use Zeta Flare and all of Final Fantasy. Um, because this still kind of, like, falls under the Final Fantasy umbrella. Um... This is where Sora and everyone fucking dies. And the power of friendship doesn't mean shit in Kingdom Jesus Hearts. Jesus Christ! Yeah, that's uh, that's the big climactic final battle. And when I first played this, I'm like, is this really it? Because I was like, 15 hours into the game, I'm like, the, like, is it? Are we really ending the game on a loss? Because like, the way it all played out, I'm like, shit! Like, this is bold from Nomura. Of course, the whole fucking timeline resets and you go back through and do a bunch of bullshit and then, you know, none of that matters. So the, the source still technically is kind of, you know, dead. Um, or part of the quadratum or whatever you want to try and piece together from whatever the acid trip that is Kingdom Hearts uh, actually is for Kingdom Hearts 4. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, like, everyone dies in that battle. Like, it's the entirety of the the heroes are just decimated by Xehanort's forces. And it is possibly one of the darkest things I've seen out of a Disney-adjacent property ever. Yeah, but I don't think it is the... the, the darkest that you're probably going to see because that honor is probably going to go to power rangers rpm because that is technically a disney series <laughs> i always forget that that's technically disney property yep yeah, it is um and there is one particular bit that i am waiting for i am waiting for tyler's reaction to that bit rpm cause... is technically like one of the darkest things i've ever watched and yeah my, that it's is like, for it... that age group anyway obviously yeah because it's going to be, like, one of the biggest gut punches ever. That series is going to be rough to get through at times. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, but, but, yeah, yeah. like, that's, like, you've seen Sora be kind of handed victory after victory after victory pretty easily up until that point. And then you just watch all of that effort just go down the drain in, like, ten minutes. <laughs> it's wild. Uh, but, yeah, no. Um... That's my submission right now. Uh, I got to pull up a couple others because we, we came into this a little little heavy here. Yeah. I'd say my submission, like, just off the off the bat, um, particularly um, based, um, based on what I remember is I'm... A lot of people want me to use one, one particular one just because of, like, it's such an easy one to use, but... No, I'm gonna go for the one that's just the biggest f u to all the fandom, uh, uh, all the fandom, and that's the poke, and that's Pokemon. Um, now, a lot of people would be like, "Oh, you're gonna pick the one where Ash's Pikachu lost to a level five Sli 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 Snivy." No, I'm not, because by that logic, people should people should hit, um, bash on Rukia for losing to a Hollow that she could have easily defeated in the first in the first chapter slash episode of Bleach. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna bash on that. What I am gonna bash, and this is not excusable, is Tobias. Tobias was just the biggest hack ever, um, and even though it's a big loss for Ash, it's one of the most infuriating loss losses ever because it's like Ash at that point was like at the peak of his development, and it's like, okay, who's he gonna face? Oh, we don't really have anyone who 
who he can be realistically defeated to. I know. We ate all those hackers who use game sharks in the games. Let's let's give them a taste of the moment so by giving this guy a a level one hundred Darkrai and Latias. <laughs> so yeah, that is what I'm gonna like with 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 the with the snivy bit, I get what they were trying to do. It's like Pikachu had his energy drained by a le by a legendary, so they were distracted by that. And it seemed like Snivy because it was using Leaf Storm. It was more than a level five Snivy. So Leaf I Tornado. Pardon? It it wasn't Leaf Storm. It was Leaf Tornado. Leaf um, Tornado. But still, it's it's a way too OP move for for a start for a literal starter Pokemon. So I can understand why Pikachu lost to that. And like I said, to Bash on Pikachu for that is to bash on Rukia for losing to um, Fishbone D, I, who, who Rukia could have so easily defeated. But yeah, with Tobias, there is no excuse. Tobias was just like the biggest like F you to everyone. Yeah, that's, that's a fair it, one. Is, is that a bad time to mention that Leaf Tornado in Gen 5 is a, is a move with 65 base power and 90% accuracy? Jesus yeah. Christ. And Pikachu has always been like a glass cannon Pokemon, if you really think about it. Like, yeah. when Pikachu gets hit hard, he goes down. Yeah, I mean, this is like an idiot being handed, like, the most powerful starter at the time. You know, uh, Ash was never smart at how he trained his Pokemon. He was meant to be no. the insert for the kid playing the game. Yeah, uh, and... Uh, um, and a lot of people now, um, just to go off on a quick tangent, a lot of people now are bashing, are, are bashing the rise. They say they're not bashing the risers, but they clearly are because they're like, oh, why can't we, why couldn't we've had this type of story for Ash? And I'm like, Ash was never meant to be that type of character. No, he, like, it's a cartoon aimed primarily at children. Like, yeah. you're not going to have this perfect trainer out of it you're going to have somebody that the kid can relate to we're not going to have like final fantasy or you know dark souls level writing and storytelling woven into this we're going to have you know something that a kid can sit down and watch after they get out of school like i'm I'd sorry you don't get your like fucking shakespearean storytelling out of a children's cartoon <laughs> and yeah it's kind of, and yeah it's kind of funny because that's pretty much what horizons is doing now i mean it's not it's not shakespeare in any way but it's still it's that's still treated as like okay this is an actual story we know where we're going with this yeah i mean it's marketed differently now like for 20 years we had a generation where we had kids treated as if they're stupid right you know look at the writing for stuff like the early bakugan and early digimon they weren't written perfectly they were written to treat us like you know actual children who had no access to, you know, better forms of entertainment. Now they realize they have to actually hook the kids because they have the attention span of a fucking goldfish. <clears throat> you leave Bakugan out of this. <laughs> I'm joking. I know. Uh, oh, uh, oh, yeah. I am so looking forward to when when God. eventually we do get to Bakugan. We gotta um, suffer through Naruto first. Oh, oh. God. Um, but, yeah. Um, so, yeah. I would argue that that is probably one of Ash's biggest. Uh, that's probably Ash's biggest loss out of the whole franchise. Uh, uh, I don't know if I you say, have uh, any what? other opinion. No, I think that's his I biggest. I would say. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. I was saying it was probably his biggest loss out of everything. Like it's not like as memorable as like him losing to Lieutenant Surge over and over again, but like. It's definitely okay. His he only he only lost to Lieutenant Surge once. <laughs> he gotta use the Thunderstone. The Thunderstone. God, I fucking hate that voice in the dub. It's so bad. Hey, baby bought along a baby Pokemon. Uh, don't be silly, Lieutenant Surge. Pichu doesn't exist yet. <laughs> Anyway, Tyler, what were you going to say? I will say probably uh, Ash's, I would say, second biggest loss was uh, probably against Alon in the Kalos League. Because I remember, like, oh. 
Okay. Everybody was like hyper pissed about it. Yeah, everyone was. Like, it was mainly because of what the Japanese style of the episode was called. Do you remember what, remember what it was called? Uh, pee pee poo poo headwife chair. No, um, Kalos League victory. Satoshi's ultimate. Uh, Satoshi. Satoshi's ultimate battle. So everyone with that tell uh, with that uh, episode title was assuming he was going to win. Um, so which is why I think a lot, which is why I think they tried to rectify that with the uh, Lola League. Um, but no, with um, the Carlos League, I can buy alarm beating um, uh, beating uh, Ash Greninja because the if you watch the um, Mega Evolution specials, you know that Alon's uh, Charizard went through a lot of mega, a lot of megas, and it went to toe to toe with two legendary primal forms. So I could buy it that he had more experience with his Mega Evolution than Ash and Greninja did with their form. Yeah. Uh, Plus, as well, this, this is the same. This is the same Mega Charizard X that like uh, went went. Went up against a primal Groudon. Yeah, and, so it's not like he's going up against some some chump. Yeah, and also as well, um, it's Mega Charizard X, so it was like Dragon Fire, so um, literally Water Shuriken sure would be neutral. Yeah, well, of, um, yeah, two times. Yeah, so um, a lot of people are pissed at that, and I can see I can see why, but at the same time, it I don't consider it. No, no, no. I would say his second biggest loss. Um, oh, what would be what? Uh, hmm, I'm just trying to think. Uh, no, no. I'd say that's a that's one of them. Go ahead. Yeah, I'd say that was one of them. Like his second biggest loss. I was gonna bring up a random battle, but that was just a random battle. Like I don't think it's worth mentioning. <laughs> Uh, if I had to think, like, of like another at loss of Ash, that I'm also thinking of uh, his battle against Drake in the Hoenn League because that was like a kind of instrumental to his growth to show that his arrogance has been getting in the way. Yeah, 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 and I do like when. Even if a character loses, like they still like learn a lesson out of it. But I think that's an an important thing to learn, especially for kids. That even if that loss is a better teacher than victory will ever be. Yeah, and it and it's kind of it's kind of funny, yeah, uh, um, because a lot of people don't seem to see that. All they see is just on the uh, face value service. Uh. uh and I don't know whether that's like an influence on society itself. Like everybody has to be a winner now, and if they're not, then they suck. So, yeah. Uh, but yeah, I would say out of all of Ash's um, biggest L's, that they they are ones that instantly come to mind. And um, and uh, like I said, I'm not counting the one where he lost to a Snivy. <laughs> Because that has been memed to death um, enough times. But, yeah, since um, since I brought up Bleach, I might as well, like, oh, what, w- what would be a big loss in Bleach? That's, uh, that's the question. Uh, I would say the Serial Squad in the manga. <laughs> that, yeah, yeah, I would say that is probably, like, the biggest L in Bleach, the Serial Squad in the manga, because they were... They were an absolute joke. No mm. question about it. In the manga. The anime though, however, oh, 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 oh they actually been, put up a fight. They have been redeemed one hundred percent. I can say that with one hundred percent constant they um at this point in the at this point in the manga uh, not in the manga, in the anime, the Seal Squad have absolutely killed killed all of uh, killed all the Quincy's. And it's probably going to be a roundabout way for that for the quiz to get around it for Yuha to become the Soul King at this point. I want. Uh, I want to say. I want to. Okay. Uh, oh, do I spoil what? Do I spoil it? Do I say what? Do I say what happens? Go for it. Um. Okay. 
Um, the Great Weaver, you, you know, like Sentrimon Shutara. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Bon Kai. We get Ooh. the we we get we get the seal we get the seal one of the seal squads bonkai in the anime. Nice, yeah, and it is go it is gorgeous. It is when that happened, I was like, what? 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 Oh my god, this is so cool! And yeah, so I'd say just um, just from like a more recent. Uh, recent example in the past few years, like the Serious Squad just absolutely um, being decimated in the manga, but thankfully the gods and prayers answered and they've re- been redeemed in the anime. It's it's interesting. Um, but, um, yeah, like I, I figured spoiling um, a giant chunk of. Um, Kingdom Hearts 3 at the beginning would be enough to be like, yeah, if anybody wanted to skip spoilers, they could just leave at that point. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, another loss I can think of from Bleach uh, would be uh, Ichigo uh, when he first met Renji and Byakuya. So I, I think was... that just goes Go ahead. to show like how out of his league Ichigo was at that point. And if he's gonna save Rukia, he can't bullshit. Oh no, no. Um, but that's always been kind of like a uh, issue with each of those characters. Like he's kind of ru- rushed before thinking at times. Mm-hmm. Like um, even after that loss, he was like, "I'm gonna go and save Rukia," and it's like. Yeah, do you really think you could do it in your state? Like, you lost to the captain and lieutenant of the 6th division. Um, uh, you really think you could do uh, do more than that, uh, Ichigo? No, you have to train your ass off in order to get by the all of them. Mm-hmm. And, like, we see him, you know, we see him overcome uh, the, his inner hollow. We see him unlock his Shikai and... Even like going even further beyond that in the Soul Society when he unlocks his Bong guy. Yeah, and it was, and uh, that's usually the point where a lot of people um, see uh, see as the peak of Bleach. I mean, I I'm sort of in agreement, but at the same time, that have been good point. There have been really amazing points after that. Um, no, no less being. Um, being what we saw with Shunsui's Bonkai, which is coming up in the Thousand Year Blood War for the for animes only. Oh yeah. So, yeah, that is good. That is going to be what. That is going to be one I'm looking forward to. Um, I would say another big loss in uh, in Bleach uh, myself w- would be um, would be uh, or oh, oh. um like um. Yeah, the um, the first invasion of the Soul Society in Thousand Year Blood War because that was like just an absolute curve stomp. Like, uh, yeah, yeah, Biarchia versus Asnot the first the first time. Like, just how much Biarchia was out of his league and um, and how much Asnot just drilled him into a wall and only the fan only the fans saved Biarchia from certain death. Because hmm. can you can you imagine what would have happened if Biakira died? Like how uh, how events would have played out differently? Yeah, no, that's a good mm-hmm. point. Yeah, yeah. Um, and just for the fact that at that point, like after that defeat, like yeah, I would say like out of all the. Out, out of all the L's from just the lo- uh, for just like the captain's level, that that was probably the biggest one because Biakia was absolutely decimated. Like literally, it was cr- his life was fading before his before his eyes. And he had to do like the one thing that I think he probably like. Um, uh, it, it's probably going to regret regretfully be be regretfully be with him for the rest of his life. He had to actually beg Ichigo to save the Soul Society. Something that. I don't think he, he ever even conceived, conceivably thought about before. Like, that loss broke that man, period. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah. In the same way that uh, I think the loss of um, Ace um, broke um, Luffy and the loss of his crew broke him. Which, hey, perfect segue into talking about One Piece losses. Um, the biggest one, like I said, uh, just said, comes to mind. The Straw Hats were completely and utterly decimated. Oh, yeah. Because, yeah. I mean, the Straw Hats at that point, they had lost They had lost before. Like, Luffy losing to Crocodile um, twice, uh, t- twice in Alabasta. But they never suffered a loss like that before. Like where, yeah, they, where they had to go up against an admiral and Ku- and Kuma, and we got um, as well during that portion of the story, we got the nothing happens bit as well, right? Um, right before, right before that, and just seeing just everyone just get blipped away. Um, it it was just it was it was a big moment for the series. Like I feel like that was probably like the turning point for the series in general. I would agree with that, and oh, yeah. it kind of goes into my point again how um, how losses can impact you more and be more uh, uh, detrimental to your success than successes that I've made before. But, uh... But, like, after that point, like, you know, uh, you know, Luffy tries to go rescue Ace, and he fails at that when Ace uh, decides to go off on his own to try to fight a Kainu after he talks shit about Whitebeard. Which, uh, which by the way, going, going on that point, now that you've brought that up, Tyler, um, somebody blames, some, um, somebody on YouTube blames Sorrow, Sorrow for that. Zoro for the okay. death of Ace. Okay, okay, uh, okay. Not for the death of Ace, but for Luffy being reckless in going to save Ace, in the sense that they think that L- Zoro should have told Luffy what happened in the nothing happened scene, because apparently, if Luffy had known about that, he would have been more, much more careful in in uh, uh, not be as reckless as going to save Ace. It was on a stream that R- Roger Space was on. And um, Roger had to say to the guy, like, okay, you've got, you've got to know that this is Luffy we're talking about here. Luffy is not the sharpest tool in the shed. And it's like, and even, and even if Zoro had told Luffy about what happened in Nothing Happens, nothing, I don't think nothing would have changed, in my opinion. Because Luffy's always going to be, like, the reckless one of just being like, hey, I'm going to go and punch a guy who could turn into a giant and five and fish dragon. Referencing Kaido, then. Yeah, like, and also Luke, as well, a reckless mofo, like, yeah, and also as well, um, with um, uh, to cover that guy's point, uh, like, I don't think they realize uh, realize the situation uh, the situation fully because it's like, um, even if Saul had told Luffy about what happened, he would have still gone and tried to save Ace because. Ace, his FIFA card was literally fading away, and Luffy cares about Ace. And imagine, imagine if, um, imagine putting it in Luffy's shoes. Like you're being told, like, oh, my friend sacrificed, um, uh, nearly, di- nearly killed himself for me. It's like, okay, maybe I should be more careful. But like, no, my brother is on the cusp of dying here. If I, if I, have, if I have to go to hell and back to save him, I'm gonna go and save him. Yeah. Yeah, it's like in those situations when you when it, I feel like a lot of people um, seem to forget some of the um, some of the uh, some of these points as well. It's like when it comes to family members, it's like it doesn't matter what anybody says; all logic just goes completely out of the window, mm-hmm. and everyone mm-hmm. would be uh, everyone would be reckless. So I don't know why that guy really blames Sora for what happened with Ace. And it was Ace's fault in the end, because Ace literally caused his death, if you really think about it. Because they were going to get away, and it was only because Akainu was talking smack about Whitebeard to that he lost his temper. Mm-hmm. It's definitely like... But... Um, good... Oh, go ahead. That's definitely a good point. I'm just trying to think, like... Uh, I was just gonna say, but I feel like um, the uh, with the 
learning from the loss. I feel like that's kind of what why you probably like Jimbe as well, uh, Tyler, a lot. Because Jimbe mm-hmm. was the one who actually smacked Luffy back to his senses and thought like, yeah, Ace is gone, but who who do you have right now? Is yeah, like like, like it's also because Jinbei bas- basically uh, brought Luffy back to from from his lowest point, and like I think that like cements him already in my mind as like a per- like a perfect crew member because you know being in that kind of environment all uh, loyalty goes a hell of a lot a long way you know you're dealing with all this crazy shit you're dealing with oh uh we got to fight this guy who could turn into sand oh now we're up in the sky islands and this guy basically smites people like nothing uh got to fight an admiral got to fight all these robots like just a a, basically, a, just a guy being there, acting as a rock. You know, someone who will be there for you every step of the way. That goes a hell of a distance. Hmm. Oh yeah. Hey. And like Luffy had that in like Zoro, but you know Zoro isn't there right now. So, yeah, and I've always felt like because uh, a lot of people are like, oh, what is um, Sorrel's role in the series? I feel um, Sorrel's biggest role in the series is like he's got to be there to keep Luffy in check. Like Lu- uh, Sorrel, I feel like is uh, aside from Ace, is like I would say is more of a brother to Luffy than Ace at times. Oh, one hundred percent. Cause yeah, Soro Soro um uh, cause yeah, Soro respects Luffy, but at the same time it's like uh like particularly I think one of the perfect examples is after um after um Usopp's big loss to Luffy and Luffy was just gonna be like, Hey, we're gonna bring Usopp back, he's like, Oh no, you're not. You're not you're not taking this down lightly. You've got you've gotta put your foot down with him. Mm-hmm. So yeah, uh, yeah. So being like the older brother figure to Luffy and being like his confidant, but also like making sure he doesn't do like half the stupid stuff that he probably would do if Saul wasn't there. Oh, Oh, one hundred percent. Exactly. Yeah. Like in all honesty, like uh, well, actually, I can kind of see that guy's point now. Like if Saul was there with Luffy at the time, like. Um, when he knew about Ace, I think Saul would have like um, pulled him back a bit and be like, "Hey, no, don't go rushing into this thing." But then again, um, blaming Saul for what happened to Ace, yeah, no, I don't agree with that. Um, Neither do I. But I will say another big loss for uh, Luffy in general was a more recent one where he lost to Kaido like about four times. In Wano, like how many times did he actually lose to uh, Kaido before he actually got the uh, KO? Well, let's see. There was the there was the one loss at the end of Act One where Luffy then gets thrown to jail with Kid. Uh there was the time. Like, how many times did he fight uh, Kaido and Onigashima? I think it was like three times he fought him. Yeah, and like all those times he did like tag out, like he tagged out with Zoro, tagged out with Yamato. Like, he had to like tag in and out. Yeah. So let me. Uh, okay. So I'm on Kaido's Wikipedia page. So Kaido versus Monkey D. Luffy. So that's one. Uh. uh Kaido for. So Kaido first. So there's one, two, three, and four. Okay, so he did. He has fought like four times against Kaido. Jesus so, Christ. Yeah. So, but um, 
So yeah, uh, anybody who's there saying like, "Oh, this car- uh, this character because they lose um, this one time is a bad, is a fraud character." Look at Luffy; he's lost like I don't know how Horrible many fights. Horrible character, he's actually weakest in One Piece, Kaido best. Yeah, and, and then Kaido loses to Luffy. Luffy's strongest character in One Piece, Kaido fraud. Yep, honestly. I um I, I got one more here. It's a more recent one. Um, th- any of you play the intro to Final Fantasy sixteen? No, no. Really? <laughs> to be a moment, I would be. I hope uh, Ann Arbor would hop in. So the entire intro to Final Fantasy sixteen is the main character just getting his shit kicked in, right? It's an homage to the original Final Fantasy, uh, which was the game that was made to save Square. But anyway, um, it's this Game of Thrones-esque world where you kind of just... You live in like this medieval European country, and and that has its own problems with the storytelling, but I'm not here to talk storytelling, I'm just here to talk losses. And then by the end of the prologue, you are you have lost your brother to your perspective you you've lost your brother you think he's dead right and your ass is getting sold into slavery to be a soldier for hire literally that is the opening to this game wow You proceed throughout the game to, you know, reclaim your freedom and, you know, yada, 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 find your brother and destroy the crystals and all this other stuff. But it's a Final Fantasy game about destroying the crystals instead of using them and, you know, all those good things. But I've never seen such a dark, disturbing story from the very onset like this other than Game of Thrones. That's the only thing I could compare it to. Um... And just the fact that your first hour in this game is you just getting run through the ringer was just wild. Um, I would say you kind of more watch this game than play it, but that's my take. (laughs) Oh, yeah, that's that's um, a topic for another day. Because there's like. 20 some hours of gameplay and like 40 hours of cutscenes. <laughs> yeah. Uh yeah, that is another topic for another day like um um do uh do um when it, when it, when is a balance between gameplay and story. Not even gameplay and story cuz both of them are great with this game. It's I don't need to watch 40 hours of cutscenes. Let me play this. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, that's a whole other fucking topic that we can get into at some point. But yeah, like, that one just really was like an emotional gut punch. It's one of the two reasons I had initially bought a fucking PlayStation 5 was at the po- at the time I got it, I got it because it was like the God of War bundle. And then I um, wanted to play Final Fantasy 16. And now, obviously, Spider-Man is the other one. But yeah, like, those three titles were like the big um the big thing for me yeah um and i will say like since we're on the topic of games now i've never played this game but i know how it ends shadow of the colossus oh god yeah I, have you ever played it fex years ago yeah i should but play the rem- remaster but yeah uh, but you remember how it ends don't you you're um, basically selling your soul to revive to the, the princess. Yeah. 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 And the devil telling you, you're like, yeah, I can save it. Uh, I can save this um, princess you are, uh, you have here for a price, though. Not telling you what the price is until the actual end of the game, where it's like, yeah, the price is that I'm going to steal your soul, um, watch you die, and then after you died and regressed into an infant, then I'm going to revive her. Yeah. And also the fact that like now he's free to roam the earth basically because the things that kept him at bay are now destroyed. Yeah. So it is a um I would say I I really um is there a remastered version? 
Yeah, it got remastered back on the PS3, I believe. Um, uh, is it on the Switch? Because if it's God, on the Switch, no. oh, I would get it if it was on the Switch. I would honestly get it if it's on the Switch. Yeah, um, it's a Sony game, so it's not going to be on anything but the actually, Sony platform. Actually, you know what? I have got um, a PlayStation 2, so I'll look up see how much I can actually get the original like for. And then play. Probably 10 quid. Okay, I'm going to look that up, but yeah, because it's been one of the games that I've always wanted to play, because yeah, I just found that story interesting, because um, it's it's kind of reminiscent of um, Death Note, in a way, of like, yeah. uh, who, who is really the uh, evil one here? Oh, yeah, uh, let's see, Shadow of the Colossus, um, well, we don't want the PS3 version, but it's $20 for that, um... It's not a pricey game by any stretch of the imagination. There's a PS4 remaster too that I didn't even know existed. Oh, okay, 80, 18 pounds. I can, I can, I can do, I can live with that. Jesus Christ! I didn't expect it to be that pricey. Uh, and that's second hand. I should just expect that at this point for the secondary market, but yeah, yeah. Um, so that's one that instantly just came to mind for me. Um, uh. But yeah, Sonic is sold to the devil. I think uh, that leads me into a into another one that I that okay, it's not a loss in terms of a battle, um, but it's still a loss in terms of something emotional. And I would say um, Captain Mitchell with, uh, in Lightspeed Rescue. That's true. That's yeah. very true. Where he basically lo uh, lost because. Uh, uh, I think a lot of people look at like just losses, like oh, they're just losses in fights. But no, there are other losses that people can have in fiction, and uh, it, whether the loss of fam uh, family members or the loss of um, loss of just the power in general. But yeah, I feel like one that recently comes to mind for me is Captain Mitchell, where he basically he had no choice, uh, but it was either I let my son die. Uh, or I sacrifice him to uh, I sacrifice him to a demon to keep him alive, but I don't see him I don't see him again for like another eighteen years, and uh, and I vaguely remember that growing up, but it wasn't until um, when we recently rewatched it and we got the full contents that I actually realized like oh my god that's that is so tragic, but also such a great lesson for his character as well of like how yeah. Um, Sometimes we don't make the right uh, right choices, but um, that is okay, and we can learn from them. Kind of like what you said, Tyler. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, and of course, and of course, he gets Ryan back in the end. But just the fact that he had to go through that, that that must have taken a great deal on him. Um, uh, but yeah, since we're still on Power Rangers, I would say another big loss that uh, I feel like the biggest loss that. Um, just in terms of how much uh, of how much it's like on that day, the Power Rangers got totally and utterly defeated. Was the ending of Turbo, where um, where it was basically that point, it was like signifying like this is the end of a like massive um, massive um, point in the franchise because uh, at that point we were losing um, basically everyone. We were losing um, most of the side most of the side cast. We were losing most of the familiar locations. We were losing the first base of the Power Rangers because it gets absolutely um, concretely decimated by Diva Tox, aka the character that I think Fex would probably want to step uh, want to have them step on the most. <laughs> um, and it just segues into the next era of the franchise with the Rangers having to go into space. Uh, uh, who who are we talking about? That step and my name in there. Uh, Diva Talks. Yes, yes, Diva Talks. Please call I me. I need to be. I was just because I was just mentioning like um the biggest like loss for the Power Rangers in general would be the loss at the end of Turbo. Oh, absolutely. Like I don't think even like by today's standard, there's been a giant loss in that franchise like that. I mean, one would one would say probably one would argue like probably either Tommy um 
uh, just in the Green Revival saga, or maybe when uh, Rita and said basically was like, "Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna um, grow Rita's brother to destroy the um, Thunder Swords at the beginning of season three. But like, I don't think anything has been like such a total loss, other than like they lost their entire base of operations, they lost their powers, everything was gone. Like it was a complete and utter like team wipe there. Yeah, which I feel like that's probably why a lot of um, finales tend to tend to do that now. Like looking looking back on like um, most of the franchise, like when we get to the finale, it's like we're gonna storm the base of operations of the of the Power Rangers. Yeah, they're trying to recapture that lightning in the bottle, but sometimes you don't really want to fix what ain't broke, you know? Yeah, you gotta um, you gotta do something original, like. But that's just my which, opinion. Which I feel like is probably going to happen in the next season, um, because uh, with that that season's finale, when we get uh, with Wild Force, I don't know how accurate that statement will be, but we'll see. Uh, but yeah, one of the other losses that I would say is like just a tall curve stomp would be what we've just recently watched with um, Time Force, where Rancic basically uh, said... I don't need anyone. I'll destroy you myself. And he has the skills to pay the bills because oh, yeah. he just, be he walked through everyone in that fight. Like it wasn't even a contest. Uh, and I feel like Ransik is the only villain in the franchise that has never lost to any of the Rangers. Like he, he, uh, every time he's fought the Rangers in the series, he has just like curve stomped them. Yeah, no, he has like, he ran rough shot through, the entire team there at that finale, and then the only reason he lost, quote unquote, was because um, Nadira was holding the baby. I believe that she delivered yeah. in the previous episode. Um, that was just left abandoned in the middle of the street for you yeah know, for plot some... reasons. Obviously. For plot reasons. Uh, but I feel like I feel like they could have done the exact same the exact same point um, with. Um, uh, without the bit, without the baby, but I feel like it was kind of like a uh, like it was trying to give Ransing a point, like, hey, yeah, even though human, yeah, even though you feel you all humans are bad, like they're re they're really not, and it was only the like the innocence of humanity uh, cliches is, is that actually turned him. Yeah, because absolutely. Like you don't have a more neutral palate than an infant. Um, yeah, there's a person um, to go like full, you know angel or you know the next adolf um yeah um and yeah we'll talk more about this when we get to the time force video but yeah rans rancic um uh like it just take uh it just takes like just that one moment uh from a from a family member to uh to make them see like okay yeah i have gone too far here yeah and you know nadira being the one thing he has this twisted love for, right? His daughter. I don't think it is twisted. I, I, in all honesty, we've uh, watching the series. I don't think it, I. He, he generally does care about her. Like he's the old, like he. She's the only character in the series that he's never really um like gotten angry at, except at the end where it's like he was so consumed by hatred, yeah. and like and like we said like it uh hit. Him sh accidentally shooting her uh, at the in the final battle was like it was like a case of him thinking like, is it worth it? Like she's the only person I've ever truly had in my life through thick and thin. Is it worth um, sacrificing her for this revenge? You know she didn't. You know, well, we, we can talk about it at, in the time force video as well. But like she technically didn't get shrunk in cryo frozen either. Like we didn't see her. You know get arrested so to speak at the end of the season and it's just rancic no no um and it's kind of explained when we get to the team up because they are back for the team up in wild force okay yeah so um so yeah um but yeah those would i say at the moment are the biggest losses i mean there are going to be more that i would say coming up uh, but i feel like in terms of just like the it like for my for my um overarching impact on the franchise turbo but from like a story impact i would say it's the uh, end of time it's the end of time for the two biggest yeah. losses oh absolutely 
I mean, we technically did have, like, up until, just to, um, play middle ground there, we technically did, up until, like, the very end, potentially have the biggest loss in all the franchise until the very end with the Z-Wave. Had it yeah, been. but, again, does that, uh, oh, yeah, oh, right, yeah, because it's more, it's more like a, uh, it's more like a, um, a spiritual tag, loss. Yeah, yeah, it's a spiritual uh, loss there, like. Because, like, they won, but at the cost of Zordon, their greatest mentor, the greatest source of information in the known galaxy for the Power Rangers, sacrificing himself to, you know, save the day. And then, technically, by the end of the franchise, you know, the current franchise, did he really save the day? Because we also had, like, in um, Cosmic Fury, like, the potential for, like, the opposite of Zordon to happen with an E-Wave. Oh. Yeah. Well, uh, well, as well, like, uh, okay, slight spoiler for anybody who's not seen Cosmic Fury. Uh, Sword Swordon is technically still alive in the Morphing Grid. <laughs> it makes sense. It does make sense because a lot of people well, uh, would probably be pissed about that, but they have to remember, what did Swordon say to Andros? I'll be gone, but my spirit will live on in all that is good. And what's the Morphing Grid? All that is good. Yeah. Like, like, it makes perfect sense. Like, and even, you know, if we take into the context of the comics, like, the Morphing Grid can, you know, be corrupted. It can be manipulated. Whether, you know, look at Lord Dracon, look at the Death Ranger, look at, um, right now with Master Vile and Mistress Vile going around. Like, you, you can corrupt the Morphing Grid and manipulate it to your own will but at the same time it takes a lot to turn that against the rangers right uh yeah. the current arc that's going on in the comics um you have master vile and rita as mistress vile going around and you know corrupting and turning all the rangers into basically thralls there's no other way to put it um so, like, I showed you in the, or put in, like, the Toku chat, um, like, a couple screenshots from the latest issue. Uh, they got the Dino Charge Rangers. Um, yeah. The second they morph, their connection to the grid becomes corrupted, basically, is the way I'm interpreting it right now. Uh, and it's helping make them into these thralls that go around and do the bidding of Master and Mistress Vile. Which is a unique turn on the franchise because we've seen Evil Rangers a million times, right? But we've never seen it so easily defeated. We've never seen the Rangers like, like instantaneously defeated just by the sheer act of morphing. So like now they're have to figure out exactly how to combat that. Um. That's what I loved about the Shattered Grid storyline. That's what I'm loving about this Darkest Hour storyline. Like, they are, like, the Rangers at their weakest moments. Um, and it's just, how will they survive this? Um, I think it's really cool when the comics can dive into these, like, much darker tones than the TV show has been able to. Uh, I guess, like, the reboot's supposed to dive into, like, darker tones and everything, because it's made for a more mature audience. But... Yeah, but I don't want it to be like um, okay, like that Power Rangers um, fan film that was made where uh, that was made like a decade ago. Yeah, the where... eighty Shankar one, the dude that made um, the Castlevania the st stuff. Yeah, the dude, the dude who who was not a fan of the franchise, but felt like he knew what the franchise um, needed. Yeah. And everyone was taking it super seriously until they realized, oh, oh no, this isn't meant to be a parody. Mm hmm yeah it's um it was certainly a choice um like i love ad shankar when he's done with like captain laserhawk castlevania and all this stuff but like that was definitely a choice um and everything <laughs> yeah uh, i guess uh you guys have any more um yeah i did have um uh a 
I did have one more um, that I uh, that's coming to my head right now, and it would be um, like I said this before we started the stream, like the ending to um, the South America arc in Dot Stone. Now, All yeah, right. Dot Stone is not uh, well, just Dot Stone in general, because of the fact that. Um, because the fact, like, literally right off the bat, like, everyone took, like, a big L because they got petrified and turned to stone. Yeah, true. Yeah. Um, but all, um, but uh, also as well, like, uh, it kind of influences Senku as well. Um, because that's the tragedy of, I feel like, Senku's character as well, is that his father sacrificed so much for him just to get these... Um, Things that he would need to uh, bring back humanity, and Senku never even got a chance to say goodbye to him. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and um, and I feel like that's um, a turning point for a lot of people where they see Senku's character. Like, oh my god, this guy can actually be emotional because yeah, um, even though it's not said outright on screen or in the or in the manga, like Senku is an autistic character, but. Even autistic characters do have emotions. It's just like they show it in their own. They show it in their own way. Yeah. Um, but yeah, with with South with South America, uh, I would say that is uh, like just with the characters actually being alive in the series and not being like encapsulated in stone. Like that's probably the biggest loss for them because they were up against like a ruthless like. I want to get back my I want to get back my life partner and I'm going to go through hell and back slaughtering everyone to get him back. And it's like we have no choice. We cannot beat this guy because the second he comes across us, he is going to try and kill us. Like he he was he was willing to kill a child. Like when you're willing to kill a child, like okay, you know like yeah, there is no way you can defeat this guy. So how are you going to do it? We're going to activate the self-destruct and by self-destruct we mean turn ourselves into stone. But at the same time, at that point, they knew, um, like, okay, yeah, even though we're taking a loss here, we're kind of, like, winning the war that we've kind of set up here, and we know we're going to come back from this in the future. So it's a loss, but it's a loss that actually that actually benefits the characters. Yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting way to take a loss. Uh, because, like, at the end of the day, like, that whole plan, like wait just rested on like one thing going wrong and they'd be fucked right like oh yeah one abs tiny thing went wrong oh, yeah. and everything absolutely absolutely like if like if suika came back and then just immediately died then the whole the whole world would have been screwed uh-huh like the the fate oh. of the universe rested on literally a child Yes, and she said she saved the world. Like, like I, I cannot stress that enough. A little girl that was half blind saved the world. Yeah, that's crazy like, to think about. On on her on her own. Like, and I don't know people are gonna give me. I don't know people give me flack for this, but when Deku can do that, I will say Deku is a better character than Suika. <laughs> Deku could never. Deku could never. Um, <laughs> Deku is the most worthless fucking MC in all of Jump. Oh, I'm going to get uh, death threats for that. Oh, hey, you, you say that? You, hey, you say that, but uh, I personally disagree. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, well, uh, half the t half the time I'm just messing about because Deku's just the easiest target. I just hate Deku as a character. <laughs> <laughs> Always have. Um, but like, I, I, I think. The the last one I have here, and I don't know if you would qualify it as a loss, but it comes from Cosmic Theory, right? Oh, the, I think I know which what 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 you're gonna say. So we start off that season, you know, a few months removed from you know Dino Fury. And well, it's not technically a few months because it's actually literally meant to take place after um, after the end of Dino Fury. But we also have to take into account that f the once and always has to take effect too, because it's meant yeah, to also uh, follow that. Apparently, apparently, um, once and always takes place before like it, 
it takes place like around halfway through Dino Fury. Like, that is ins- that is the the fucking stupidest timeline. <laughs> I'm sorry. No, 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 no. I've that actually, is the no, funnest no, timeline. No, no, I've no, I think I remember. Like, okay, so once and always takes place in like the six months gap between like the last uh, between like the penultimate scene and the last where, where it says six months later. Like during that six months, that's when Once and Always is supposed to take place, apparently. Okay, fine, I'll buy that. Um, anyway, we start off, we have the powers basically taken away from the Rangers. Where we have no Zato. So we're without a leader, we have Billy filling in as like a pseudo leader that's not even the same team. I don't care. I don't care. I am gonna fight this fight until the day I die. I don't care what anyone what anyone says. Billy is a member of the Cosmic Fury team. He he might be a member of the Cosmic Fury team, but that is fucking heckle. Is is the the fucking nutcase from Ninja Storm or Ninja Steel? Dino the, Charge. Or, uh, no, I mean the 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 stupid red oh, rain. The mechanic. Mi- mechanic. Mi- hey, don't mi- talk shit about mechanic. No, I mechanic. love the. I love the fact that he's a mechanic and his name is Mick Panic. Is is he part of fucking Cosmic Fury team? Or are we counting Te- the- Technically, I guess yes. Okay. Sort of. Okay, okay, then I'll buy it. Because he's piloting his Zord, he's doing fights like Billy yes. was. Okay, yes, yeah, yeah, yes. You and know, he was there dro- and he was there during the morphing calls as well. well no, was he there during the morphing No, I don't think he was. He was there during he? one morphing call. Okay, then yes. You know. So we we see them take a loss basically right off the bat. Right? And then they have to go through this entire like two episode journey basically with no powers, basically useless. Only for Billy to like retrofit them some powers based on some dinosaurs and then solon is also the final fucking ranger which i think is hilarious uh like solon and getting the being the final power there for freaking fern that's just amazing. i love that i love that uh, solanosaurus powers rule and fern deserved that that yeah, win even after though even though the it. even though the solanosaurus is not a real dinosaur Neither is a fucking griffin, okay? And neither is a saber-toothed tiger, and yet they constantly keep having a saber-toothed tiger in these dino series. Well, it's a, it's a prehistoric creature that's good enough for them. <laughs> neither uh, is a fucking dragon, okay? <laughs> but, it, but here's the question. Would you... Uh, because technically Billy is the mentor to the Cosmic Fury team, like, would you say that... Um, like, because that's kind. Because technically, Mitchell is part of Lightspeed Rescue, and he's the and he's the mentor, so he's technically part of the team. Yeah. So, would you count mentors as part of the team? I mean, technically, would we also? Then Billy, then Billy is a Cosmic Fury. Uh, then Billy is part of the Cosmic Fury team. End of discussion. Would we also count, you know, Wes's dad there? The final fight of uh, fucking. Uh, uh, um. N- n- no. Really? No. Really? Really? He was ready to throw ha- he did throw hands with Rancic. He, 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 oh he my- threw hands with the main villain as a civilian. Oh my god, do we have to include what's his dad? Okay, he was fine. a mentor for the Silver Guardians, which also held Eric, who was also the sixth ranger. <laughs> Okay, fine. We can include Wes's dad. <laughs> I just, I just, if I we want to get them. into the nitty gritty semantics of Power Rangers, <laughs> I just hate, I just hate the fact that they don't class Billy as a member of the team, even though he's part, even though he's part, pi- even though he's, even though he, you know, he's over even here though, like, not even, even though, doing like it's morphin time. He's just fucking Triceratops. <laughs> yeah, but. Uh, no, no, he did have one. It's morphin time. Um, uh, but yeah, 
um, Billy, I, I still count Billy as part of the team for for the reason of like he pilots the swords more than all. He never pilots the Cosmic Fury swords. No, that I know, and that's so weird. But I mean, he's over here being a simp slave to fucking Lord Zed for half the season. <laughs> you know, it, it just un unrightfully getting the girl back too after being such a dick. <laughs> um, still, it could have been worse. <laughs> Alex. Yeah, no, absolutely. No, I don't oh, think what? any fucking ranger is going to be worse than Alex to me. Oh, we're gonna, we're gonna, right, we're gonna um, rip Alex a new one when he get when we get to when we get to the Time Force video. <laughs> and I think we should stop um, actually um, spoiling off track with our cosmic with what we're probably gonna have in Cosmic Fury video. <laughs> yeah, no, like we still need to film that. We still need to film Time Force. Oh yeah. God. We're we're two seasons in that we haven't recorded. <laughs> but yeah, so yeah, so what? Well, so we have the big loss with them having no powers, and uh, and um, even though it is a loss, it kind of is a loss with a positive uh, outlook <laughs> on things. Um, yeah, w- with um, Sato literally um, becoming a go. Uh, becoming a ghost, which I find that hel- I find that hel- hilarious. The, the that- fandom's gonna hate my thumbnail. The fan is oh, gonna yeah, hit my thumbnail because I I know what the thumbnail is. Um, um, fans be mad because Cosmic Fury is cool, cool, cool. <laughs> um, I love that somebody had pre pre screen cap that for me, so I didn't have to do a bit of the work. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so the Rangers did suffer a loss because of Sato becoming uh, Sato basically sacrificing himself twice. Yeah. In the span of two seasons and. Literally turning himself into a morphing master. I mean, that's a win for him. Look at how powerful he is now. Yeah, which that 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 makes me want to see Sato in a death battle. Honestly, yeah. But who who would he who would he fight? Like Tyler, who would you actually have um, fight Sato in a death battle? Okay, so Zato's whole thing is that he's an alien from sixty five million years ago who gets who gets cryogenic who gets. Well, who gets put into a deep sleep in the night. Um, uh, part of me wants to go... At, I do have a joke pick. And that's Fry from Futurama. But that's that's kind of my joke pick. I mean, I no, get where you're coming from. No, I, I get where you're coming from. But no, I've got the perfect... I've got the perfect one for Fry. Uh, which... Goes into one of my what, what like another loss that I have, um, um, uh, which I'll talk about in a bit. Uh, but carry on, Tyler. Uh, okay, so, uh, I'm trying to think here. Um, trying to re- reconnect with these people. I'm trying to reconnect with alien heritage. Why am I thinking of Jake the Dog from Adventure Time? Oh god. Oh god. You know what? I kind of now want to see that. Like Like mainly from the episode where Slyther disguised himself as a Rafconian. And like uh cause Jake is part alien and like was trying to reconnect with his father. But he turned out to be a scumbag. Yeah. Okay. Well, that seems like. But now I'm thinking of Jake, Jake the dog versus Peter Quill. But. Uh, hold on. Let me let me check the death battle Discord because that's where I get a lot of my matchups. Okay. Well, while you do that, I'll say um, I'll say what I what I think is the perfect swarm for Fry, and that would be and it goes into my other loss, and that would be um, Lister from Red Dwarf. Because, I was thinking of a uh... red. No, because um, uh, Lister gets cryogenically frozen like Fry, winds up in the fu- winds up in the future. Um, it's is uh, is an absolute. Uh, I assume. Um, Fry is not the sharpest tool in the shed. 
Would you say that's accurate? Uh, yeah. Yeah, same with Lister. Lister is not the sharpest tool in the shed. And also, they're technically, uh, they technically start their own families up. Mm hmm yeah um but yeah that's uh, red dwarf i would say um in terms of uh live action losses that is what that is one that definitely does come to mind because like with um like with um dot stone red dwarf starts off with um basically the entire cast um uh, the entire cast being wiped out except for one person but in this case it's much worse they cannot come back because they're not turned to stone they're wiped out because of a radiation leak so they're all dead they're all essentially dead and Lister's the only one left alive and just to hear that hear that even though it's a comedy uh and it's played for laughs it's it has quite a dark undertone because like everyone you've ever known and ever loved is is dead and you're trapped in deep space um having been awakened three million years in the future and even though it's never it not shown an awful lot um there are times when he's like flashing back to times when it's like um with his drinking buddies and it's just reminiscent like now he is alone like he's got no one he can really connect with so mm. just just in terms of just like an emotional like human human element or uh, i would say that's big right because even the most um introverted of people like whether or not we like to admit it at times we we still need like someone there with us just for basic companionship oh yeah, yeah. even e e even even people like you cannot stand like um in any other circumstances you would be like i don't want to be in the same room as this person like just for the simple fact of just someone to talk to you need that at times oh I god damn it well, and I've, I've i found one go ahead i got one uh <sighs> Zato versus Garnet from Steven Universe. Red color stoic humanoid leaders that defected from their home worlds to fight a war that killed most of their comrades. Both gain, both gain from powers from fusing with their allies on a genetic level. Both would be hiding in be in hiding for thousands of years before returning in the modern day to fight off their old enemies and lead their team. Both are semi-psychic with some drawbacks and which they can share via uh, with others via phys physical contact. Both would be reunited with an old war buddy. Okay, yeah, that is a perfect matchup for Sato. Uh, but yeah, uh, so going back to my point, and yeah, and that's uh, and it just leads into one of my other points that I thought about now that I thought about it, um, like. That whole idea of being alone in the un uh, alone and having no one to talk to, I, it makes me surprised that the lonely or abandonment uh, or abandonment devil have not been introduced in Chainsaw Man, which uh, goes into my section of just just Makima, just Makima, just Makima. Because <laughs> um, okay, people who okay spoilers for the. Uh, Chainsaw Man anime that uh, even though you could go and easily read the manga and to all those people who are like I don't want to read the manga I just want to watch the anime okay are you going to watch it English subtitles uh, so yeah no no excuse no excuse on that point um, but yeah so the biggest loss I feel in Chainsaw Man is definitely uh, Denji Denji's breakdown <laughs> Or as I or as, or as I Tyler remind uh, Tyler I remember Tyler saying, "Denji buddy, Denji buddy." <laughs> yeah, cause just for just for how insanely evil that loss is to Denji, like he loses his brother figure. He he has to fight his uh, his, his um it, uh, the equivalent to his older brother and kill him. Because um, of the fact that Makima made a contract with him, and then he has to kill his little, and then is, he watches his basically his kid sister get killed right in front of him by Makima. Like, how do you come back from something like that? That's the funny thing. He oh. didn't. Denji Denji has so many issues that I don't think we're even going to touch on half of them. 
I don't know about you, facts. Like, Denji is literally, like, the human embodiment of PTSD. (laughs) Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Like, Like, he's watched his brother, his sister, and all of his comrades die around him. He's now raising his grooming, like, mother figure baby form, you know, and also the fact that he can't even turn into Chainsaw Man right now because of plot reasons. So he has, yeah. like, a a woman who literally sexually assaulted him as a bodyguard while also being hunted by the fucking government. Like, the dude has it so rough for no reason. <laughs> uh, yeah, and he's being manipulated by all sides. Like, Nayuta's manipulating game, Asa's manipulating game... Yoshida is manipulating game. Like, is there no one that's not manipulating Denji at the moment? Is Asa manipulating him or is Yoru? Uh, I think both of them are because I think um, Asa's mini- manipulating him, like, of the fact, like, hey, I just want, I just want someone in my life at this moment in time that's not, that's not taking control of my body. I mean, that's fair, but I, I feel like she's not manipulating him to the level of, like, manipulation. I think she just needs somebody. Yeah. Like, I, I feel like there's a difference between, like, needing somebody and manipulation. Because she's not looking for, like, ulterior motives. She's not trying to gain anything other than, like, a friend. You know? Yeah, yeah. Um, But my my, my God, like, that... Lo- like, I, I remember reading that reading that chapter of just being like i'm gonna build you up and then bring you down and technically she did succeed because she has broken she she technically did set out what she wanted to do break down denji enough so that she could have the chainsaw man in her life because she's technically done that um even though she's not going to be there to witness it Mm -hmm. so it's a loss for denji but a win for makima but yeah, and another one, um, I, they, they've just been coming to me one after another, like these losses, but I'm going to go, uh, I'm going to go as well for my last one, Rising of the Shield Hero. Oh God. You know what I'm going to mention, like, oh mm. my God, there's, there's, there's three that I can actually mention right off the bat. Okay, so, um, uh, now Fumi getting manipulated by, uh, by um uh bitch and um and basically uh being a social piranha i'm not gonna say the i'm not gonna say what happened because of youtube um uh but yeah and him just being uh, him just becoming a shell of his former self and becoming like just this bit basically turning into an eric from power ages time force yeah yeah that's one way to yeah, uh, uh, like just a chip on his shoulder, envious, jealous, and bitter. <laughs> um, and then, even after all of that, um, going through that first episode and sort of trying to get his life back together, uh, and having that duel with um, with um, with Simpy Max Spear Simp. Uh, yeah, that's the name I'm going to call him from now on, Simpy Max Spear Simp. <laughs> Um, even then, nope, we can't let Naofumi take away. We have to cheat in order to get him to lose. That, that was just like, oh my god, di- I want to see these guys suffer in the worst possible way for what they're doing to him. But, oh my god, I... I can't, I can't, I don't want to say, I don't want to say it because I really, really really wanted Tyler to witness this but it involves Ra- Raftali- Raftalia's backstory but yeah Fex you know what I'm talking about mm-hmm. with that mm-hmm. yeah just that moment I, w- I would say like people often say like who do you sympathize more for a tragic backstory like Raftalia is the one that comes to mind for me I've been really sympathizing with Bartholomew Kuma Oh yeah, but I thought, but K- Kuma, Kuma as well. But oh my god, Raf, Raf, Tali, Raf Tali, yeah, like that just breaks my heart every time I see that backstory. Um, but of course, I think um, 
Red, if he was watching this video, would probably say like, "Yeah, I'm gonna say um, uh, uh, Made in Abyss because Made in Abyss is high up there for like just like um, that tragic backstory." Fucking series is a mind meld. Hey, that like every fucking scene in Made in Abyss is trauma. Oh yeah, absolute trauma. <laughs> Like that that is the the series you need to watch in case you ever thought you needed therapy because you will need therapy after watching it. I think oh no 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 oh, no no no. Oh, they're lined up. No 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 no. There is one series that everybody needs therapy after watching or reading it. Promise you know Never the one. Promise Neverland you... season 2. Uh, what? I'm sorry. What? No, that does not exist. No, no, no. It begins with B, has a K at the end, uh, and it involves a certain uh, hateable character in the form of a in the form of really wavy white hair. <laughs> yeah. See if you can. Uh, okay, three, two, one. Uh, on three, two, one. See if you can guess who I'm thinking of. Three, two, one. Yeah, I can't think of it. Griffith, <laughs> Berserk, Berserk, like I, anybody who needs fair, uh, anybody, if there's like, anyone that needs to there's, there's chop. Like, I, I don't know why I didn't think of that one, but like, I, I don't, maybe it's because I read it in middle school originally. I guess I started reading it in middle school. Like, yeah, I, you, you and I know, but I'm like, what the, what the hell, how, how were you reading this in middle school? Uh, Probably because we're old as shit. You're as old as I am, Luke. Yeah, I, I, I'm. I, I'm five months older than you, and I wasn't reading stuff like that. I was reading it in like seventh grade. Okay, <laughs> there, there. I think that says exactly what kind of fucked up I am. <laughs> yeah, but my god, um, if we want to talk about like um, biggest L's in fiction, I feel the like Eclipse. Berserk. The, the eclipse tops it definitely like that moment like just for sheer just for sheer impact of just how much it um of just how much build up there was to that moment in in the series from like how long that that flashback arc is just like it takes the cake definitely like what was your impact reading it Tyler uh, reading berserk at uh, the eclipse i just i was in stunned silence i had no words that could uh that could uh really express how i felt this is a series where the fans have lovingly dubbed a certain horse and no, the series no no do, yeah. no do no do not mention. Do not mention that. Yeah, do you not can, Yeah, you can Google the name of the horse of berserk. Um, yeah, yeah. So, um, and again, we're gonna be um, we're gonna be talking more about this when we do the berserk video because we already have the title in mind: How to Break a British Guy Read Berserk. Also, lovingly co-piloted by How to Break a British Guy, make them read Sword Art Online. No, <laughs> I think Sword Art Online is traumatizing Luke more than fucking Berserk is. No, that they're, they're both up there. They're both up there. But yeah, so I think Berserk is good. Dare I say, amazing? <laughs> yeah, How dare. yeah. Oh, abso absolutely. I will not argue with that. Like, and I've uh, I've showcased this to Ann Arbor, but um, Berserk is now in my top ten favorite mangas. The, the the trauma manga is in your top ten favorite mangas. Yeah. Yes, yes, because it, even after that, like point, it's like okay, we're gonna just rip that band aid off. But where we are, where I am right now in the manga, I'm like, okay, yeah, I am, I, I am loving this. Yeah, I mean, it's a masterfully written series. It just gets so much flack because of the eclipse, and not a many people make it. Not a lot of people make it through that part. And continue, right? Like right. It, it's a point that breaks people because of the yeah. context. Yeah, uh yeah. So anybody who's um seen that big L for guts and everyone in that series, just get past it because 
that cast in the um, flashback, that is not the main cast of the series. Oh, I, I, no, but also, it's it's rough to get through that. I mean... It, it, oh, yeah, absolutely. I'm not denying it's rough to get through. Like, like I, I mean, even I, like, having read it in a bunch of, like, you know, earlier Stephen King stuff under his Richard Bachman um, pseudonym, like, the there is a lot of trauma and shit like that. Like, there's... Like, I, when they were putting it chapter two out, I'm like, how are they going to adapt the latter half of that book? Because there's a scene in there that would have gotten an NC-17 rating, if not a straight up X rating, and they did it well. Um, but at the same time, like, the, the fucking Eclipse and Berserk was rougher than that. And I'm just like, Jesus fucking Christ. Uh, but, like, once you get past that, like, you have one of the best written fantasy worlds in all of manga, oh, in my opinion. Oh yeah, absolutely. And um, and from what I've read, the um, the uh, guy who was uh, kind of like a pseudo brother to Miura, who's now overseeing Berserk, he he was there when the when uh, Miura was planning out the eclipse. So he put input into the eclipse, apparently. Yeah, like. I honestly, I honestly wouldn't be surprised if he actually, if he was actually the one who, uh, who said to him like, "No, no, you need more tragedy in this. How about you have Griffith do this to Casca?" Yeah, probably. Yeah. Like it, w- it wouldn't surprise me if he was the one who suggested that. It wouldn't shock me. And yeah. it's, um, it's wild to think about, like. Now that Miura is gone, we're still getting the series to continue on because a lot of a lot of these um, series, like once their author dies, there's nobody there that has the manuscripts or nobody that has like an idea of what um, what that continuation point would be. Like that's why I'm with High School of the Dead, right? You have one season, a few extra chapters in the anime, but there wasn't enough to or in the manga. But there wasn't enough to adapt uh, to continue that. Then we know how legendary that mo- that series is in the horror genre, right? Yeah. Um. But doesn't like uh, doesn't like the brother of the manga have um have the notes or I've, or something like that? To an extent, but he doesn't know the direction that the story was supposed to go on past what was set up, right? Because it was a series. From what I remember reading way back in the day, um. And this could be right or it could be wrong because, like, this was internet forum era. Um, like, that series was planned, like, two to three chapters in advance and not much past that. It was just a lot of, you know, kind of like what we get with a lot of the weekly Shonen Jump stuff now, right? Like, where they write, they know a beginning, yeah. they know an ending, and then they plan uh like one to two chapters uh and not much in between so like he felt it would be doing a disservice to a lot of the characters by just continuing it from how he felt without the guidance you know of like a manuscript or anything like that um so okay. that's why i kind of just got shelved for e- eternity there um that could be wrong in that and it could just be a mistranslation it could just be like speculation it could be a lot of different things but that's what I remember from way back in the day. Because uh, that was one of my favorite series as a teenager was High School of the Dead. And obviously because, like, Booba everywhere and fans. Yeah, yeah, I was going to say, it was obviously because of the jizzle, Jiggle Physics. Listen, I am simple. I, I see Big Booba and Jiggle Physics, and I go yeah, crazy. I, like, fucking Party James put that uh, screenshot of fucking... Hunter girlfriends in this chat. I'm like, I'm really enjoying <laughs> seeing the plot of the series. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. Well, with with uh, with 100 girlfriends, you don't tend to watch it for you tend to watch it for the crazy or read it for the crazy crazy antics because where they are right now in the anime, it's not even the craziest that they've got they've got. And like when you literally have the main cat the, the the main character. Um, simping over all his girlfriends to the point that it will probably take an entire episode to get through that simping. You know you're not at the crazy antics. Nah. Yeah. Uh, 
I am wait. I am so looking forward to seeing how that's going to be adapted. God. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it, I would say, um, yeah, one of my final points that I want to bring up for terms of big losses is um, the MCU with um, Infinity War. Yeah. Yeah, uh, like where, um, much as like we like to bash on where the MCU is right now, like when that moment actually happened, because uh, I don't think a lot of people expected it to like actually go there, but they went there. It's crazy. Like, yeah. I I didn't expect. I knew that we were going to see a major loss in the MCU, right? You know, and right now the major loss is like the MCU being worth a damn. Uh, but like there, there is so, so much to be said about adapting the infinity gauntlet, the infinity saga shit. Right. Um, because that is like a cornerstone of comic, you know, history, the, in, the original infinity gauntlet comics, right. Where you're having Thanos, you know, run just right through every hero. And I knew, you know, as a Marvel fan, like not having people like Wolverine and Silver Surfer and a lot of these, you know, essential pieces is going to be hard to adapt something as emotionally gripping as the original source material. And they did a really good job by just having like half the population get blipped out of existence. You know, you yeah. see a lot of the heroes just die, essentially, there at the end. And you're having to wait basically a year between the two parts of this. So yeah, to I'd, get in game, you're still there questioning and theory crafting, and you're still, you know, not having eight seasons of television in between it, ruining it. Because you're having, you know, little bits and pieces of it spoon-fed to you that way now. Whereas, like, between... Infinity War and Endgame, you're just sitting there at the edge of your seat. Like, well, how is Ant Man going, going to, you know, come into play? How is, you know, everybody that's dead going to come back? Is there going to be any repercussions for the time they lost? And you know, a lot of it might be hindsight now, but I still think it's one of the best written Marvel movies of all time. Yeah, uh, and in uh, and in hindsight, there was repercussions because of what uh, what happened with. Um, with Falcon and uh, Falcon and Winter Soldier, how it's like, yeah, uh, yeah, you've come, yeah, yeah, you may maybe a hero will save the world, but yeah, it's still you've still you've still lost uh, di this this thing and that thing because you were blipped away by the by the final snap. Yeah, the fucking series is such a mind fuck because it makes sense because he was essentially like on the payroll of the government you know still you know so being yeah. dead for six months means he was dead literally like because a missing person after six months is declared legally dead by the government right yeah and it was five it was a five year time gap before everyone actually came back so like you're you're really you're really fucked there <laughs> yeah um but I would say like the biggest, uh, like just the biggest, like oomph to get through in that in that moment in that um what in that movie is just the I don't want to go bit with uh, with Peter Parker. I don't want you to go. Like, like just him, like just struggling to hang on to things, and it's a really, and it's really um the most gut punching moment because if anyone's seen um Spider Man Homecoming, um. Mm -hmm. Tony uh, Tony actually asks him like what if you died then that's on me and he literally was the last person Pia hugged before essentially dying yeah yeah like you you got to think about like it, it was masterful also in the fact that like you knew whose contracts were getting renewed and weren't getting renewed right at that point, because it kind of leaked out, like, okay, so Chris Evans isn't coming back. You're, you're not getting, you know, um, Scarlett Johansson back after, uh, you know, this, this, and this. Uh, number of things. Robert Downey Jr.'s contract wasn't getting renewed and all this. So you're like, well, it's mostly the fucking people 
that contracts were over that are staying. So you knew the the fresh kids were going to come back. You know, like the Guardians of the Galaxy. You were going to get back. You know, Peter Parker. You you're going to get like all of these, you know, young characters back. But you're still sitting there like, how and wh what's all going to happen here? Uh, because of that, right? And it's such a like looking back, it's such an interesting concept of like holding your audience's attention well. And I think that's the thing that Marvel's really lost now recently, you know, with how they're handling like the multi, you know, the multimedia release of like streaming series and you're holding that that movie, you know, there. Like I completely forgot until like I saw the, the stupid cat poster the other day that the Marvels was even coming out because the last like thing i was seeing was loki i'm like right cause, so that's the thing that's out but i'm like right loki's a fucking disney plus show <laughs> i it's kind of lost the plot now and i miss that era of marvel where you're held in suspense for six seven eight months between releases um the this era that we we're talking about here was so unique and i don't think any franchise is ever going to recapture that because now we expect everything to follow the current marvel trend right like look yeah. at the looking at the the dc um lineup that james gunn's heading up right he's following exactly what marvel's doing now you know you're doing a series you're doing a movie you're doing a series you're doing a movie and i don't think that's a sustainable so i think like, no. the ultimate l is marvel itself because it's kind of wrote itself into a corner here. Uh, yeah. And I feel like they really need to like just slow down. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah Co that's a Go ahead, that's... Tyler. I was just about to say, like, uh, the uh, big problem with, with the MCU right now is oversaturation. Like, mm -hmm. they're doing too much shit. They're being too ambitious. Like, like we we get some good stuff, but like it's not at a cons it's not on a consistent basis now. Yeah, they're stretching oh. themselves way too thin, and it's a it, it's affecting the impact. And it's having an impact on all their like if they want to do all the TV shows and stuff, maybe just sh maybe stretch them stretch them out. Do one TV show, not. Th Five in one year. Yeah. Yeah. I, absolutely. Um, or uh, I, I'm just, and I'm just worried that when we get to the next Avengers movie, everyone's going to be like confused about like, well, who's this character? Who's that character? What's yeah. this character? What's their, inf what, what's their impact? Um, blah blah blah. Yeah, I mean, I'm seeing that on Twitter right now, at least for like the Marvels, and I figure we'll get to this when we do like the is streaming killing long form storytelling uh, video that we have planned. Um, but like a lot of people are like, who are half of these people that are being teased? And it's just like, well, one, you have to watch like secret invasion because that ties deeply into that. Uh, two, you gotta watch like about like four or five other projects that have come out since then. And it's just, it used to be like, you go, you see a movie, you go, you see a movie, you go, you see a movie and you have the whole plot there. It wasn't like, I think the entire MCU runtime now is twice the length of what it was when Endgame came out, and that's mostly because of the TV shows. Jesus Christ. Like, it took me a fucking week to sit down before Endgame, and I watched through every single Marvel movie um, back to back to back. Like, I was watching two a day to get prepped, uh, and this was while I was working full-time, too. So, I was, like, getting up early, watching this spending a week getting ready for in-game and now i would sit, have to sit down for a month if i was working full-time and yeah. doing that to prep for the marvels which yeah. is the shortest mcu movie of all time by the way oh wow it is like an hour and some change oh wow um but also as well, like another loss on Mar or another big loss on Marvel's part, Marvel's part as well. It's just the loss of the audience as well because it's like 
not everyone can spend like um it was fine when it was the pandemic and not everyone and nobody had to be anywhere but even in the pandemic other people uh, people were doing other things as well yeah no like i was working full-time through the entire fucking pandemic and that's you know a big struggle um yeah. well i was i was doing writing during the pandemic um mm-hmm. and uh i just wasn't like having the time to like sit down and watch like um 10 hours worth of content when there's like other content i want to watch yep it's an obligation now because this entire event of the mcu is created in the, like the biggest case of fomo and you want to be a part of every event right you want to go and you want to see every movie if you're a fan of the mcu right but that means now you're having to fucking sit down and you know be a part of the streaming culture you're having to sit down and watch every series every you know and the, we're kind of double dipping in topic here but well we uh had to sit down and you know struggle through these really roughly written ones too right yeah um like i know everybody loves wandavision i'm not a big fan of wandavision um I but I'm also it was not, okay. I'm not a big fan of sitcoms in general. So like the tone of that series wasn't, you know, my cup of tea. Um and it was made like a old timey sitcom. Um so like it, I wasn't the target audience for that one, you know. Um Captain America uh or Falcon Winter Soldier, right? Uh where they're, you know, testing out Falcon as the new Captain America because he got the shield. Um you're having to deal with like a war piece, you know, because that's the tone of the Captain America com- uh, content. Loki, you're dealing with like sci-fi time travel bullshit, like a Doctor Who, you know. You you have all of these that are like so tonally different, you know, that also kind of weighs into like, well, I'm not a fan of this one, so I'm not going to fucking sit down and watch 10 episodes or 8 episodes of this one because I don't like the tone of it. But then that also becomes in- integral to the next piece, uh, the next big tie-in movie, you know? So, like, the Kang Dynasty, for example, is going to have all of the, the fucking shows tie into it as well. So, you're going to have to suffer through all those ones that you didn't like, or you're going to be completely lost. <laughs> yeah, and uh, which is a loss for the audience. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, um... Or you but can just we'll sit there and you know watch a recap video on YouTube, probably, and then you'll yeah, be fine. probably, probably, which is a win for recap videos. Um, but yeah, um, uh, at least it won't be as big of a loss as um, uh, as what is probably going to happen with Star Wars. <laughs> yeah, That's which a by whole the way, other yeah, fucking bag of worms that I don't I know. want to dive into right now. <laughs> I know, but I'll just say uh, off the top of my head, biggest loss in Star Wars or execute order sixty six because it's just always re- always come back to it in some way or another. Yeah, no, uh, I mean, yeah, it started. Like, the funny thing, I'm oh, sorry, back to go ahead. I I mean, it's referenced in every piece of media now because it's nostalgia marketing, right? You got Ahsoka tying into, you had Bad Batch tying into the the tales of the Jedi. Which, um, which I love the fact that in, uh, in uh, A New Hope, um, the, uh, Obi-Wan's like, oh, the Jedi are all but extinct, and yet, and yet nowadays we're getting like, oh no, it, oh no, yeah, it was a big loss for the for the Jedi, but now we have all these other characters coming out of the woodworks. Yeah, I mean, it makes sense. It was an entire galaxy, you know, you, you could have found somebody off in a, like a pocket dimension or some shit because, you know, Star Wars, you know, plot and everything, but like, he, at the same time, like the the line of like I served with your father in the Clone Wars, you know, you never really thought of that until like the repercussions of Order sixty six, and you know the whole Clone Wars cartoon, you know. But at yeah. the same time, uh, which speaking of which, uh, with the Star uh, with the Clone Wars cartoon, I think another big loss was Ahsoka herself. I mean, because. Yeah. Because it's like she she was framed for something that she didn't commit, and then when she found out that she was innocent all this time, she turned her back on the Jedi. Because it's like, hey, 
they were uh, hey i thought i thought they would trust me and they didn't and they're saying that this was my test yeah yeah fuck your so test it's no, so it's no wonder she walked away and this also helps to kind of like uh give more content into why anakin uh, anakin jo joined palpatine mm -hmm. No, even though I think it was done well in the movies overall, because Palpatine was always mini playing it. Like people who say, like the turn comes out of nowhere in um, in Revenge of the Sith, obviously wasn't watching the movies because uh, throughout all the all I mean, the we original... were kids when we were watching these movies originally. It's Luke. not. It's not just the kids. It's the adults. The adults say this as well, and it's like. Really, go back and watch it and look at what Palpatine is doing. But like, like a lot of a lot of these YouTubers that are adults now, you know, were kids when these came out. They were us. They were literally us. They just didn't. Yeah, they oh, didn't no, no. watch I'm them. Not, like, I'm not talking about. I'm not talking about like us kids. I'm talking about people who were born in the 1980s. I <laughs> Doug Walker. Um, yeah, because literally those types of people will just say like. I'm going to turn to the doctor. Really? It was that quickly? And they're adults. They're thinking adults. So it's like, I'm talking about people like that who don't go and look and see that. Okay, this guy is clearly manipulating this very impressionable person yeah. to, to With the dog walker and people like that. Yeah. They, but they also like feed solely on drama. Like, that's why I'm not a big Channel Awesome fan, like, at all. Like, fair I, enough. Fair enough. But like, um, I, I see the, the route that people go with, like, for our generation, at least. Like, yeah, it might have seemed out of nowhere, but, like, watching it as an adult, like, oh, he's just literally grooming him to be a Sith. Like, that's that's what's happening here. You're... Yeah, yeah. Because it's like, because um, that's the power, that's the thing that Palpatine had over, the, like, um, they they thought, like, oh, they were all going to win. The Jedi thought, like, oh, they were all in control and everything. And Palpatine was just there in the background, like, no, you guys have already lost before it's even begun. <laughs> Mm -hmm. But I mean, the ultimate villain of Star Wars is Jar Jar, right? Like we can all, yeah, we can all agree I, on that. I agree with that. Like Jar Jar was the ultimate, you know, evil in the entire thing. He handed the Senate over to Palpatine because so. that uh, apparently that was what was meant to happen. Like Jar Jar was meant to be like the ultimate Sith Lord <laughs> because it was meant to be the antithesis to Yoda because Yoda was like this really scrawny like character who turned out to be the most powerful Jedi. Jar Jar was this horrible CGI creation who was turned out to be the most powerful Sith Lord. And that's why you just find him dead on crate, you know. That's that's what happened. So. Uh, well apparently well this is a loss for Jar Jar. Apparently what uh, what I heard was that he was he became a uh, he became a performance artist uh, in in the Sands of Tatooine. <laughs> That's hilarious. Uh, but Tyler, I think you were trying to get a word in there. Uh, uh I was just uh, uh about to say like I remember seeing a uh, video about by I think it was by Shafrillus about how Order sixty six started out out as just this thing that happened, but like it gained more weight over time as we saw. Mainly thanks to the Clone Wars. Right. I mean, yeah, that that's kind of what happened. Like, Order 66, you know, like, we saw originally in the movies, and then we really thought that was it. But, like, the Clone Wars kind of fleshed out, like, the clones and their, their troops and everything and their camaraderie with the Jedi that they initially bet or inevitably betray because of their programming. Um... But at the same time, you saw, like, some of them resist the call. You, some of them, you know, had their chips removed. Um, and those ones kind of carried on into things like Rebels or just retired. Um, and Obi-Wan, you see uh, one of Obi-Wan's former clones just sitting there um, begging on the side of the road. Um, kind of like parody to how our own government um, treats our vets. <laughs> um you know, kind of wild to see in fucking sci-fi. Like even in even in science fiction, the soldiers get kind of fucked over. Um, but you, you see him just toss a couple credits in there uh, to his former um, soldier who you know didn't f try and murder him. 
Uh, but like, it's it's wild, like how far-reaching Order sixty six is in that fiction, and it's still trying to tie up its loose ends to this day because you know you have eighty seven different writers trying to adapt the same thing. Which is, I think, the biggest weakness for Star Wars now. Like, you don't just have Lucas doing it. You got Filoni, you have Kathleen Kennedy, you have all of these other people dipping their fucking fingers into this. And it's become, like, a content machine. Um, Not that I'm saying any one person is responsible for the downfall of the franchise. I feel like it's too many people trying to adapt the same material. Uh, and you don't have anybody that really knows a single direction they want to take this franchise in. Um, and especially now because you're seeing like movies get announced and then quietly canceled and then announced and then quietly canceled, announced and then quietly canceled for like ever since um, like right early acquisition actually. Because we just learned that um, fucking um, Guillermo del Toro was supposed to do a movie about job of the hut right and it got canceled quietly uh, like we didn't even hear about that one originally and you know as a guillermo del toro fan like that's something i would have loved to have seen because the the man has not made a bad movie um so i wonder how bad that script actually was to see it get canceled you know before it even got announced officially uh, cause he just kind of let it loose. Like I was supposed to do something in star Wars. It was, uh, starts with an H and ends with a T uh, and everybody piece together. Like, well, that's job of the hut. That's the only character in that, um, franchise that has that. Um, so it's just interesting to think about. Um, cause a crime boss, you know, like job of the hut fits right in his fucking wheelhouse. Um, but that's just like my jaded star Wars fan. Uh, take on everything there. <laughs> yeah, I think Luke kind of agrees with me. Like, there's too many people. Um, I do, I do, I do agree. Like, there's just too many. There's just way too many people now. Uh, not uh, just with any anything. It's like don't uh, don't give losses out to uh, like, out to your audience because you're gonna lose in the end anyway mm-hmm. if you keep doing that. Yeah, I think we've talked about all the losses that we can talk about here we're an hour and 51 in oh wow we i, I was i was like worried uh, a while before like how are we even gonna pass the hour the half mark well we have done now yeah yeah we have so uh final thoughts on this one uh my final thoughts will be like uh anybody who's like saying like um no character should lose a fight ever and if they do then they're a fraud it's like no, you're you're the fraud because you don't know storytelling. Mm. That's a good that's a good one. I um I think like a loss is necessary sometimes for storytelling because you can learn from loss. You can learn from you know that failure. That failure is not the end of everything. Um I know Tyler, you had mentioned another one before we even started this video from Dragon Ball. Um like way uh, yes, it was uh Goku's loss against Master Roshi slash Jackie Chun in the twenty first ten KEG Budokai. Right. And look to characters like Goku, for example. Goku has taken more losses than anyone in fiction, really. And he is one of the most beloved characters in all of anime. Because oh. you can learn and attach yourself to somebody like Goku because he's kind of just this blank slate. And if it was not for him learning after each loss, like, okay, that that didn't work. Um, You know, I need to get stronger. I need to do this and this and this to kind of, you know, protect my loved ones and do all these fantastical beam fights because that's all fucking Dragon Ball is anymore, is beam fight after beam fight. We would not have like a lot of the current series because we there would be no inspiration for things like Bleach or Hunter x Hunter or anything like that because it is the foundation for Shonen, right? And as much as people want to argue that 
Dragon Ball is not important to history now because we're living in La La Land. It is. It is one of the most important franchises in the world. Uh, so, I guess that's it? Yeah. Peace? Yeah. Peace. Peace.